You're tuned in to the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. Powerful ideas to rock your restaurant. Here's your host, Roger Bodwin. Welcome back, everyone, to the Restaurant Rockstars podcast. I'm so excited today because I have a repeat guest, Mr. Eric Schellenberger, who is a two-time author and a restaurant and bar marketing guru. Now, Eric has this really cool analogy. If you imagine a room full of people taking a test that nobody studied for, and everyone assumes that by copying each other's paper, they're going to get the right answers and do well on the test. And what we find out that there's a bunch of different results where no one gets the right answer, and everyone is shockingly uneducated. So this analogy is applicable to those who try to copy what their neighbor is doing, or in this case, in the restaurant and bar business, it's all about copying what the competition is doing when instead you should be thinking like your consumer. What is your customer looking for? And you really need to tap into that. So this is a new approach to your marketing. You're going to want to stay tuned to this. It's really all about how social media as well has lost its effectiveness and why it should be replaced with a content marketing strategy. It's all about Google, TripAdvisor, and Yelp and tapping into the power of those platforms and how, once again, you can really figure out what your customer's thinking, what motivates them, and how to attract them to your restaurant or bar. So stay tuned. Fellow operators and managers, forget the old way of doing business. It's time to automate your back of house. To reduce food costs, optimize labor, increase efficiencies, and grow sales and profits, you need a system. The one simple system that does it all is called Restaurant 365. Restaurant 365 is a cloud-based, restaurant-specific, all-in-one accounting and back office platform that seamlessly integrates your POS, payroll provider, and all your vendors. Use it to generate accurate, user-friendly, real-time reports to make immediate data-driven decisions. Restaurant 365 eliminates manual, error-prone processes and is designed to grow with your business. Restaurant 365 handles inventory management and helps reduce food costs. It streamlines the payables management process and automates bank reconciliations, while the scheduling feature engages employees and helps reduce labor costs. To run a stronger, more efficient restaurant, take a closer look at Restaurant 365. Check it out at www.restaurant365.com forward slash rockstar. Guys, it's no secret that labor is a huge challenge right now. But putting help wanted signs in the window is not the way to find great people, especially if you're looking to fill positions in multiple locations. Instead, the answer is Fountain. Fountain is the all-in-one talent platform, especially built for teams hiring at scale. See why over 5,000 businesses, including Burger King, KFC, Taco Bell, and more, are using Fountain to find, hire, and onboard new employees today. With Fountain, you can find more quality experience candidates faster. You can shorten the time to hire and the employee onboarding process. You can track cost per hire and time per hire. Get automated SMS communication and automated document collection. Head on over to www.fountain.com forward slash rockstars and receive a demo plus free personal onboarding, a $500 value just for becoming a new Fountain customer. Check it out. Now, on with the episode. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Restaurant Rockstars podcast, engaging topics that help restaurants rock their profits, build their brands, deliver amazing guest ser- service experiences. And with me today is a former guest. Mr. Eric Schellenberger was a guest about a year ago, and he is a restaurant and bar marketing guru. He has written two books all about a different way of looking at your marketing. And we're going to talk all about that today. Welcome to the show, Eric. Thanks for coming back. Thank you for having me again. Appreciate it. Well, you know, for those of uh, our audience who missed your first episode, and of course, they can always go back to the archives and listen, but if they missed it, you know, I'd really like to give, uh, we usually start out with the backstory, and I know you've got a hospitality industry backstory that, that has been in a lot of different positions, and you've learned the, the industry and, and positions from the inside out. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, I, I was started in the industry at 13 years old. I worked for my mother, who was uh, who owned the the food and beverage department at a ski resort that I lived at in in uh, Park City, Utah. 
So I did basically everything from, and being a snowboard bum, you, uh, you're, you're kind of, uh, your, your days are kind of shot because all you do is snowboard. So I was in working in restaurants and bars at nights for my whole childhood and kind of went through the ranks from, from dishwasher to kitchen to serving management, blah, blah, all the way into corporate marketing, uh, maybe 12 years ago or so. And uh, I've been in, in corporate marketing settings since about then, working with teams of people and, and kind of uh, 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 figuring out what works, what doesn't work. And, and maybe roughly two years ago or so, started my own business, Bar Marketing Basics. And I've been out on my own and it's the best decision I've ever made since, since uh, a couple of years ago. You know, that's awesome because I did start this show by, by calling you a restaurant and bar marketing guru. And clearly you've worked with clients in, in both restaurants and bars. But, you know, I really like having you as a guest because the bar is something that we don't focus on in too many episodes here. So many restaurants have bars. So many restaurants don't take advantage of the huge profit potential of their bars. They simply serve beer, wine, maybe mixed drinks, but they're not really maximizing the potential. And you can clearly shine in that area. So that's one of the reasons why I love having you as a guest. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. The, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. What, what, whatever your thought was. Yeah, I'm going to get into that in a little while. Is is why uh, why why presentation with cocktails and and um, and the, on the bar side is so important and how, like you said, it's so profitable. And if you do it right, people will do your marketing for you if you have a good enough presentation on that side. Yeah, and there's so many different areas that that we can focus in on. I mean, everything from creating specialty cocktails that have flair that you can charge really good money for. And and the flair part is the presentation, not only in the bartenders preparing the cocktails in front of the bar customer, but when the cocktails are prepared for the servers that then carry them through the dining room and then people see them on the trays and like, ooh, what's that? I want one of those. It's like this is the, these are some of the opportunities that are missed in lots of places. They are. And uh, there's, a, there's a place in my, my, my second book, I wrote about this place called Barton G in, uh, in Los Angeles. I think they have also have a place in Miami. And they say they're, they're known for, they call it theatrical presentations. And what they do is they have, they're big with dry ice and they're big with, uh, you know, the typical stuff and the, the garnish and whatever. But the, these guys will bring you a, a, a drink on a, uh, on, on a, on a board that's, two feet in diameter with a big Buddha statue and all sorts of uh, uh, like a bridge and your drink is in this crazy glass on this really insane presentation. And that every one of their, their specialty drinks has this. And basically it's the same size drink as any other drink. It tastes great, of course, but it's, it's something that they bring it on this board. They drop it off. And of course we're taking pictures of the entire thing. The oh, drink costs, $22. And the only difference is it's got this insane presentation. So we're spending twice the price on a drink happily. And we're taking pictures of this and putting it on our own Instagram and Facebook on their behalf. So it's the most genius thing I've ever seen. The, the presentations of this place, everything, every single uh, menu item has a presentation like that. We ordered a, uh, a, a filet and it comes on a wood board with, I'm not even exaggerating, a four foot tall metal fork sticking out of the board. And you cannot miss it. They, they pull these things through the, through the restaurant and they can barely hold it up. And of course, what happens, everybody all of a sudden orders the filet. So you're selling a, you know, an $85 filet because of the fact that it has this insane presentation. And, oh and it, it's, it's so easy to yes. do that, but yes. nobody, nobody goes to that length. Simple. It just takes creativity, a little bit of resourcefulness, imagination, of course. But I mean, look at what that does to your profitability and your marketing. More importantly, okay, super profitable to sell these things in the restaurant. But let's talk about the exponential effect of people pulling out their camera phones and posting this crazy stuff everywhere. And now you're suddenly driving business to your restaurant, calling attention to something that otherwise people would not have known about. And that is what we call a hook, right? And you can't have too many hooks in this business. I love those ideas. Yeah. And, and this place, this, this was insane. Is this, yeah. uh, we, 
it was hard to get a reservation. They were completely booked out. We look on Yelp and Yelp says, uh, the average, the reviews were average. Their reviews were like, well, it was cool, but I didn't like, you know, the food wasn't as good as I thought. The service was slow. It was hard to get a parking place. Typical LA stuff. Sure. But we, we go in there, the place is completely packed. We can barely even stand in the waiting area. We're looking around the place and it's, it's every single table's taken, every single bar area's taken. There's a big line out the door. There's people trying to wait. They can't get in. They are absolutely killing. And I'm looking around the place and every single table is taking pictures of not only the, what they ordered, but when they're, what they're, the table next to them ordered and the thing going by, they're taking videos of the, the next, you know, they see something, a dish going by in the room. We've got a whole entire room full of people marketing for us. Uh-huh. And it, it's, it just, I, when I was in there, I was like, oh my God, these guys got it figured out. This is exactly how it's done. That's beautiful. Well, I have always believed that, you know, the food service business, restaurant, hospitality, and bar, it's all about entertainment. It's showbiz, man. And you're there to dazzle the public, give them the reasons to come back again so that they want to see the show over and over again. But better yet, you know, just spread the word, you know, social media, virally, virtually telling people face to face. It's like, you got to go to that place because, man, wh- this was over the top. You know, and not everybody can execute to that level, but just that kind of thinking in, infused into your marketing is like, think of how powerful that is. Even if you tone it back 10 different ways, you can come up with ideas like this that people are going to pull out their cameras and they're going to be, you know, captivated by what you're doing. I love it. Right. And uh, yeah, not everybody can have the opportunity that, that the middle of, of Hollywood and LA has. I mean, they have an unfair advantage, of course. But mm-hmm. the, yeah, to, to think about it like this is that their own social media and, and marketing pages are very limited in reach. They're very limited in power these days. As we all know, uh, social media reach is getting dwindled down to the point of it's almost worthless, in my opinion. And these, but what, 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 how you get around that is when everybody else is posting it on their own personal pages. There's no censorship. There's a whole new audience every single time somebody posts it on their page. Instead of you hitting the same guy over the head with your stuff a million times in a row on your own pages, story, he's like, oh, I, I get it. Okay, I've been there. I understand. And they unfollow you or they quit paying attention to your stuff. Now you're reaching an entire new audience times 100 every single night over and over and over. So that, that's, that's, that's what we don't, put enough emphasis on and really realize is that if you, if, if I post on my own pages, I'm advertising, right? If my customers post on their pages on my behalf, they're bragging about my business on my behalf. So what do you think is more powerful? You know, that, that's a genius of that. Yeah. Turning, well, turning both your staff and your customers into brand ambassadors for your business. Cause one, it's so fun to work there and, and there's such a buzz going on that the staff can't help but get involved and they're sharing it to their network. And then everybody that sees it says, Oh, that's cool. And I'm going to share it. And then the customers are, yeah, that's where really where the, where the rubber hits the road. I mean, that's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was one of the most, most successful yeah. I don't even know if they meant it to be a marketing campaign. This meant it to be something cool, but it was it was the most well done approach I think I've ever seen. Took on a life of its own. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it did for sure. I'd call that you know capturing lightning in a bottle. You know, <laughs> it was. And there, uh, and the other thing about the place was was uh, like I said, it was it, on the outside. It, it didn't look all that uh, uh, impressive by the by the reviews and by this other stuff, but now that we've gone back there, I've talked about it so many times and, you know, word of mouth is of course king. Yep. Okay. I've told everybody that, that is in the LA area, you've got to go check that place out. And I'm a little ambassador for them and, and I don't have anything to gain. I just thought it was a great place to go. Well, I'll tag them in this episode if you care to share. What's sure. the name of the place? Barton G. Barton G. All yeah. Right, I'll write that down. Let me get a pen. Thank you. That's awesome. Well, that's a great way to start the show. We just gave people a really powerful, easily executable new idea that'll drive business. And more than that, just create a brand. You know, I often recommend, Eric, and I know you do too. It's like, don't run a restaurant, folks. 
build and run a brand. And not only that, turn every customer into a brand ambassador, turn every staff person into a brand ambassador, and literally people are paying you to market your business. There's nothing more powerful. Sure. And when it comes to your marketing, I've said it a hundred times. I probably said it in the last episode uh, that I was with you is be the show, not the commercial. And every time people do their marketing or do their social or whatever they do, they're, they're advertising. They're being the commercial. It's boring. It's a picture of food. Hey, come see us. We're open happy hours at three. And it's the same crap over and over and over. But the minute you're the show and you provide entertainment and you provide value on that level and you have something clever to do, clever to say, clever video, Mm -hmm. that's when you win and creativity, like you said, is totally free right. and our right. people rarely take advantage of creativity. Well, it's not just the owner or the manager that should come up with this stuff. I mean, we used to have regular brainstorming sessions where we'd gather the whole team and just throw stuff at the wall and say, Hey, you know, what ideas do you have this week? What could we, you know, and it's amazing where ideas can come from. They can come from anywhere, but look at where it can lead, you know? Yep. Yeah, we uh, when I was back in the uh, in the corporate marketing space, and I was working for the a bunch of nightclubs here in Scottsdale, Arizona, we would have weekly meetings on that same thing, and we would get the the best ideas came from. We're talking about a subject, and we're like, "You guys, this is so dumb! Like, this party is never going to work. It's it's just you know, this is this is a terrible idea." And then someone will it'll, will mention a twist on that idea, and then yeah. we're like, "Oh my god, that's great!" Yes, we roll with it, and it would be successful. Yeah, so the germ of the idea didn't seem great at first until someone put a little spin on it and suddenly, whoa, now it clicks. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. yeah, that same place right now has a, you know how, how big all of a sudden White Claw is with, uh, with bars? It just came out of nowhere. And now everybody carries White Claw, which is the, uh, you know, that, that flavored seltzer. In my opinion, it tastes horrible, but it's, it sure has taken off. And, it has, yes. Those spiked so seltzers, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like a, it, it, to me, it tastes like a, a, a vodka soda with a little tiny bit of, of flavoring and maybe some Windex in there. It just tastes horrible, but um, it, it's, it's wildly popular. So that this, one of these places in, in the area did a, um, you know, the, the, the carnival claw machine, you know, the, uh, the, the, the claw machine, you put a you know, quarter in and it picks up the stuffed animal. Well, they did, they put white claw cans in the claw machine and so if you win one of those, you win a White Claw. And people would actually go to that bar for that reason to try and win that thing. And they would spend way more than a White Claw cost in order to get one. So great idea. All these things are great ideas. Uh, we used to have the claw games, but obviously they were just so that the parents would be happy eating their dinner while the kids were stuffing $20 bills into the coin changer to keep right. them occupied. And that was another profit center for us. But I mean, there's another spin on something that you can do to get the, the adults involved. And if you've got the real estate, that's, you know, that's space well used, I would say. Sure, sure. It worked great. And it was just so simple. That's, come with, that's the kind of things those brainstorming sessions uh, evolve into. That's killer. Yeah. Okay. Let's keep going then. Market, market, market. What else can you come up with that's really going to knock the socks off uh, your customers and blow away the competition? That's what it's all about. This is a competitive business and that's the fun part of running a bar or a restaurant. It's like you, you always want to stay ahead of the competition and you want to just dominate, you know, and that should be the driving force behind your passion for this business. You don't just want to run a restaurant. You want to build an unstoppable brand. Or else, what's the point, right? Why do it? <laughs> right. <laughs> anyway, this, that was my philosophy when I ran restaurants. And now I'm running one again. So it's like the, you know, the thinking cap is back on. It's like, okay, what can we do now to transform and, and come up with something really cool? And we are involving our staff in that. You're right. And uh, this, uh, I just wrote another article for Bar Business Magazine. And it was, uh, they wanted me to write something on the, the future of marketing in 2020 and beyond. Yeah. And uh, so it, I, took a good couple of months to think about that. Like what is going to be the future of marketing a restaurant? And the, I came up with two, I think are kind of common sense, but it takes a second to digest it and think why uh, uh, sort of ingredients for success going forward. And it's aesthetics. So like we talked about Barton G with the presentations, right? It's right. the aesthetic of the entire place because think about what we are as humans nowadays. You go, you go anywhere in public and everybody is glued to their phone. I mean, their phone is in front of their face a hundred percent of the time that they're not, you know, drive, even when they're driving. But, oh, so 24 yeah, seven, it doesn't matter. Yeah. We all so do it. Everybody has a phone stuck to their head 
all the time. And then, but everybody's uh, uh, content on, and I, I don't necessarily, content on social media, yes, but also your content on Google, your content on Yelp, your content where all these people that have never heard of you before are going to find you. They're not going to find you on social media if they've never heard of you before because you can't follow someone you don't know exists. But exactly right. If, if they see your content on Google, your content on TripAdvisor, Yelp, these places, is it updated? Is it attractive? And uh, the minute we, we just default to the same old, well, I have five burger pictures I took with my cell phone. Just put those up and let's just get that. That obviously doesn't work and it's going to not work even more in the future because everybody is kind of realizing that they have to be attractive and they have to be better looking in three second attention span than the competition. So everybody's up in their game who, who, who are players and the people who pay attention, the people who market effectively, they know this. So they're, they're getting their aesthetics so dialed in that all their pictures look amazing. And everybody's using these, these uh, kind of ridiculous professional photo shoots. They look great. I did the same thing with, with my books. My first book, the, the photo on the cover cost me 150 bucks. It's not a bad photo. The second book, the cover photo cost me $1,000 for one photo. And it looks phenomenally better. And again, I'm using the same exact uh, 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 method that I teach is that you better look aesthetically as pleasing as possible surrounded by your competition. So my book is surrounded with my competition on Amazon and I think it's a more eye-catching photo than all of them out there. I wouldn't disagree. Do you want to demonstrate that point by showing us the two covers yeah, side by so side? This is, this is the first book right here. Let me see if I can get... Okay, so yep, I can see it that's the first one. Yep. And it's, it's not bad. And uh, by the way, I named this, these books Restaurant and Bar Marketing for a reason. It's not a very creative name, but it's a keyword that people type into Google. And I've talked to a couple people here in Arizona that, that I, I know of them and they, they got a hold of me and said, man, I bought your book and I don't even know, didn't know who you are. And it turns out you live in the same town as we know all the same people. And I've just typed in restaurant bar marketing. That's sure smart. enough. Yeah, that's just so smart. It's, it's, it's keywords. And yeah, this is exactly yeah. why I, that's what, I mean, I'm in the SEO business. I better work with, with keywords. So right. that's, this is the second one. And this is, there we go. And I don't know if it's got a good, lot of glare on it, but oh, there. I, see it. I see it well. So that's, it's the same. You can tell it's the same series. You can tell it's, it's related to the first one, yep. but the, the, the picture is so much better and so much richer. And I think uh, kind of relays a, a better understanding of what it is that this one is, in my opinion, that's a, a way better aesthetic than the first one is. And so I'm going to, and this is going to be a series of books. I'm going to keep going with these. So uh, they're going to be, I'm going to have to one up myself every time with that, with that uh, cover photo. But so the, the, the point is if you've got, uh, here's, here's the other thing. If you've got the, a very aesthetically pleasing lure out there on Google, Yelp, TripAdvisor, social media, all this stuff, all your marketing is really attractive. If that person does make a visit and they do come in and they see, man, this is nowhere near what it looks like. And it's, it's kind of a letdown once they walk in the door. That is going to be a one and done guy. So, and, and this sound, this isn't necessarily marketing. This is building design. And this is, uh, you know, kind of planning out the, your, your, your aesthetic of your actual building. But that has to match. It has to be as attractive as it looks online. And a professional photo shoot, as you know, can make your place look way better than it is. But uh, we have to follow that up with an actually aesthetically pleasing building and business and the whole thing. Uh, one of the things I get into with the second book is my analogy of, I call, I call it business tinder. So think of your marketing and think of your aesthetic in terms of a dating profile. So if, it was, if your look and if your whole online presence was a tinder profile, would you score? Would you get a person in the door? Would you score a new customer? And that's, that's something that, that if you think about it on those terms, like, well, if, if, if you're single and if you have a dating profile, you, of course, choose the best possible picture of yourself for that first one, for that three-second attention span when someone's scrolling. And yeah, it, you're not going to put a, an average picture of yourself. You're, of course, going to use 
or you may even go out of your way to create a new photo that looks so much better. But with businesses, people just tend to like, well, this one, I, I guess this will work. That Whatever. Don't care. And that, that's been the attitude of the past. But I hope we get over that. And I hope we can get to the fact of we are up against the stiffest competition we ever have been. It's going to get worse. And, uh, and, and the aesthetic is everything. Remember, three-second te- three attention spans from the public is probably going to get closer to two-second attention spans. But if you don't catch that eyeball in three seconds, they're gone. And it's becoming harder and harder ever to, to uh, uh, grab that attention. Yeah, you can't take shortcuts. You got to go pro. And if you've got pride in what you're doing, why wouldn't you want to go pro and do the best you, know, you can to you know, attract attention? You know, and the aesthetic, you're right. It's, it's all about, okay, so the food and drink is one very important attribute. And that's a given, right? People go out and they expect yep. the food and drinks to be good. And they certainly expect that, you know, the ambiance is going to be attractive and inviting and comfortable. I mean, that's very, very important as well as the service. Those three things are the three most important things. But one of the things that brings them back again is how they feel in the space. And if they want to take photos of the space and share that with their audience and say, hey, you know, this is this is really grooving. I feel something special about myself when I'm in this space, you know, all those. Yep. yep. They're they're uh, And what I noticed that, that a lot of restaurants these days are doing, especially in areas that are very trendy spots. Uh, Scottsdale in L.A. is where I spend a lot of my time. And there's uh, a new place called Toca Madera that started in L.A. Yeah, and now they just created one in in Scottsdale. I don't know if you've heard of them or not, but it's it's a, a so kind of fine dining meets meets Mexican sort of, and but their their look is not only extremely attractive. I mean, I think their build out was five million dollars, and uh, yeah. on the inside alone. Wow! And the uh, wow. the the place is so well done, but they have a little bit of edge, and the place is Day of the Dead kind of theme. So they have oh gotcha oh yeah skulls and stuff that. everywhere. So a yeah. lot of a lot of restaurant design in the past, people would be like, skulls, are you kidding me? We're not putting that in a restaurant. But they, they, they did it, and they have huge oil paintings of, of you know, the, uh, the Day of the Dead masks and the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And it works so well. It, works, it speaks to that crowd so well that I find myself going back there over and over because I don't even, can't even tell you why. So if it's one of those, it, and uh, in, okay, so in the, in the uh, second book, I call this the it factor. You know how they call uh, 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 actors and musicians, like they, they have it. That it factor that you can't really explain is what these places like Toka Madera have, that I don't know why I'm going back there. I could put my finger on it. The food's great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The service is great, blah, blah, blah. We all, yes. you know, they all do a great job at that. But why do I choose that over the 20 other equally awesome places right within the same zip code of both of these places. And it's, if you can capture that it factor of all the, all the, the it's, it comes down to not only the building design, but it comes down to the, the music choice, the music volume, the smell of the place. Uh, you know, the, the, everything that they put, they do, they do these little 1% slivers so well that all those 1% add up to be such a great experience that it's the place that I subconsciously find myself wanting to go back to. I so totally it, get it. You know, that it, I love that analogy, the it analogy, because I used to use that, well, I'm using it now, but when I ran restaurants for 20 years and bars, it's like I trained my staff to have that it quality. And mm-hmm. I defined it as the unique combination of personality, attentiveness, product knowledge, and salesmanship. And when, when, a, per, when a staff person bartender, server, even the hosts and the busters were trained to sell, but we trained everybody to have those four attributes. And then that was developing it. And the customers got it because we had it. And that was a huge part of our marketing, but this transforms, you know, every aspect of your operation. It's not just the ambiance. It's not just the service. It's not the training. It's the food and beverage. It's all those things combined and your online presence and your reviews and what your customers think of you. All of that makes the difference between being it, having it, and just being an also ran, you know, a competitor that can't compete because you're dominating. I love these ideas. That's right. And, and I've seen places around here that, that they don't necessarily know what they're doing as far as restaurant design. 
Right. I've seen places that they put $3 million into a brand new build out and the place is a complete flop and nobody goes there because it just does not have it. You walk in, you're like, it's trying to be something that it didn't quite achieve. Exactly people, right. People get that right away. It's like, hmm, this didn't quite work. And you can feel it. The execution went flat or, you know, they went, they went off on some tangent that no one could really understand. But this is expensive stuff. And if it doesn't have that end result of, yeah, you capture the magic, then yikes. That's right. And here, here's, my, here's my analogy is um, Apple versus Samsung products, right? So I'm a Samsung guy. I've tried Apple products. I hate them. But, and I don't really understand why someone is going to spend twice as much money on, in my opinion, inferior product. Okay. But almost everybody in our business are Apple people. And they're, they're, I'm, I'm by far in the minority of this whole thing. But I'm a PC guy. I'm, an, I'm a, you know, a Samsung guy. I've tried iMacs. I've tried iPhones. I just cannot stand them. But, and so I ask people, like, why do, you, why do you have an iPhone? Why do you like an iPhone? And like, well, you know, it's because I can sync all my, my files across all these these different platforms. Well, yeah, I can do that with my Samsung and my PC also, just as an app that anybody can use. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. But I like the fact that, that it's, uh, it saves all my passwords and I don't have to type it. Yeah, well, I can do that too. And we go into these things of like, yes, I can do that too. I can do that too. At the end of the conversation, they're like, you know what? I don't know. Just leave me alone. I just like it. Yeah. And so enough of these conversations go by and then I'm just right. like, okay, so you don't know why you like it, but you're willing to spend twice the price because Apple is sexy and their products are attractive and they look phenomenal. And that look and that sexiness is exactly why Apple sells. They don't sell because they're easy to type on or because they offer a different experience or because they offer something that the next guy doesn't have. That has nothing to do with it. They are damn sexy and people love that and you don't know why, but you just love them. Yeah, and a lot of people are sheep too, and they'll buy a, that an Apple product just because it's what their friends and their neighbors and their family Absolutely have, too. not necessarily because of the differentiation of features or it works better or it's better designed. I mean, I totally agree with you. I mean, people are, yeah, you know, follow the herd is the general <laughs> mentality when you and I are trying to get people to break out of your traditional thought pattern, your comfort zone, think a little bit differently. And I hate using out of the box because it's well worn out cliche, but you know, it's like mm -hmm. you really got to think different than what everyone else is doing. And that's how you stand out. And that's how you capture the imagination of the public. But that was a really great example. So you're here, the Samsung guy. Yo, yeah, yeah. I always have been. And I, I had a couple businesses at a time. And one of them, I had an app that I had to test on an iPhone. So I had to have an iPhone and I mm. absolutely hated it. It was, it just did not, it, me and it did not get along and I couldn't type on it. I had to like type one letter at a time in backspace, type another one at a time. I'm like, okay, I can't. But anyway, so, okay. Good segue from, from that yeah. is the, so I posted something on social, on my own social media, personal Facebook page saying, I have a challenge. Oh, and I put this in a couple of uh, restaurant owner groups. I'm on Facebook. Said I have a challenge for people and social media for, for bars and restaurants, for anybody who's promoting something on social, for the most part, it's not measurable. We don't know if it works or not. And a lot of these, a lot of the clients I go into, they're asking me if I can take over their social media because they always say the guy doing it right now is not getting any results. And I said, well, is it the guy or is it social media that's not getting results? We don't know. Could you do this for us? And my answer is absolutely not. I will not do it because I don't believe in it. I'm, I'm, I don't think you're going to get your money back out if you pay somebody else to do it. And I think that it is entirely ineffective here in 2019 and 2020. It's going to be worse. And what I mean is free posts, paid strategic yeah. posts, totally different. So focusing on free stuff, there's going rate is about a thousand to 1500 bucks a month for them to pay, whether it's a server or a bartender or a third party marketing company to post free posts on social media, which is insane. It is. Yeah. If you're paying a thousand, fifteen hundred dollars a month, you're going to have to profit an additional 15 grand that there's no possible mathematical way that's going to happen. And so, but people don't do that math. So anyway, my challenge was don't post a single thing for an entire month, a month that we can, that, that there's no other uh, uh, different anomalies. Don't know their market changes. There's, it's, it is exactly the same market it was last month, last year, whatever. And let's compare it. 
let's compare your numbers. Let's say we do it in, in November or December. Let's compare to last December. Let's compare to, to, uh, uh, to, to November, to January. Let's see what happened. What's the actual uh, difference? So now there's something we can measure. So now we know. We're not guessing. We know we didn't do social media this month. Here's what our number was. We did it this month. Here's what our number was. <clears throat> there you go. There's your difference. Like I said, assuming all mar- other market conditions are the same. But nobody wanted to do it. Everyone's like, oh, no, I, I can't do that. I can't not post. It's like, well, well, you just admitted you have no clue if it's working or not. You don't know right. if it's bringing $1 in the door. Right. But the, the, the sheep mentality is, yeah. I can't not do that. I mean, I'm yeah, going yeah. to go broke. But, and I don't think one person took me up on it. And I was like, man, at, at what expense do you think it's going to cost you for you to absolutely know if it's working or not? I mean, that, that's the most valuable data you could possibly have, but nobody wants to do it. Just insane to me. Oh my God. (laughs) Let's talk about, you presented a concept in your first book that really intrigued me. It was the fishbowl versus the ocean. What's that concept all about? Bring that to life for us. Yep. So the, uh, the fishbowl is your, your pool of existing customers, right? So it's your social media lists, your email databases. If you have a text message marketing campaign, all these lists of customers that you market to. And so these are the people you hit over the head with the same kind of stuff over and over and over and all of your marketing. And in most cases, most people, most restaurant owners will only market to their fishbowl and they'll, they'll try to get other people from contests or from whatever into that fishbowl so they can market to them. The ocean is the, the pool of all consumers, whether they've heard of you or not, whether they have, have bought from you or not. It's everybody exists in this ocean, which is the, and the ocean of people use Google, Yelp, and TripAdvisor. That's go. the three tools. And if we think like consumers, we think, okay, what do we do if we're in an unfamiliar place? If we don't know where we're going, everybody, of course, knows their own neighborhood. And then don't, don't apply it to your own neighborhood with your own bar or restaurant. That's irrelevant. Apply it to when you're in Vegas, when you're across the country, when you're out of the country. What do you do? Short of asking the local, you pick up your computer in your pocket, Google, Yelp, TripAdvisor. That's it. But everybody ignores those three because they don't know how to use it. They don't know how to optimize that. And so in, instead of hiring a professional, which they're, like I said, they're more than happy to hire a professional to post worthless posts on their social yeah, media. Right, no right. problem there. But we're the undecided customer who's actually looking for us. They hesitate to put money into search engine optimization or to reputation management or to any of these things that that customer is looking at us. That is the first impression is on these three platforms. But how many of us just completely ignore that because they say, well, I don't know how to get to the top of the Google search results, so I'm going to ignore it. And which is, is completely insane to me. It's so easy. It's so cheap for a third party. That's what I do for a living. There's a lot of them out there. If you find somebody who's good at SEO and can get you to the to get your traffic up there provably, if they can prove traffic, not only can they prove impressions and eyeballs on your brand, but through search engine optimization, we can prove somebody who gets that, you know, the get directions button in Google. So if we can measure that get directions button, so somebody is it's basically as measurable as a as a conversion can possibly get in marketing. So this is a person who was hungry pulled out their computer, went to Google, typed in Mexican restaurants or whatever, and they found you, you're close to the top, they'd never been there before, so they have to hit the get directions button. In theory, they walk in the door, they spend money. Does not get any more of a conversion than that. So if we can use these techniques and measure that, now we know if it's working, we don't have to test it, we know that you know 100 people got directions this month after we optimized, 250 people got directions. And then the beautiful part is we can do the math and say, okay, what are my services costing you? They're equivalent to how many clicks of that get directions button, right? Say it's eight or 10. In most cases, it's about that. So we can say, okay, I'm costing you say 10 clicks. We just upped it by 130. So there's no gray area. There's no, well, I guess it worked. I guess it didn't. It's mathematically either it works or it doesn't. No question about it. That's why I love the business of search engine optimization 
it's not, it's not, it's not based on opinion. It's based on fact. And, and that's, and it's, it's insanely cheaper than people think it is. So they just assume, I don't know how to do it. My hostess doesn't know how to do it. I can't pass it off to a staff member. So screw it. So the people who do do it, all we have to do is make a little bit of effort and we're dominating everybody. That's one of the things that that's crazy to me that people don't take seriously and they don't take the ocean of consumers seriously because they figure, well, I'm on Yelp, whether I like it or not. And most people honestly don't like it, but uh, they're on Google, which they do like, whether they like it or not, they're in TripAdvisor. They like that. And, but they're like, well, I'm, I'm there, I guess. What am I going to do? But there's so much opportunity with all three of those platforms. And most people uh, uh, will get reviews. They will not respond to their reviews. You've got the power to respond to your own reviews, but they don't even, they don't thank their fans. They don't put out fires. They don't flag the reviews that can potentially be removed that are negatives, derogatories or whatever. And they don't even pay attention to this. They sh- everybody has, we all know, every, I've been, 100% of the restaurant owners out there will say, I absolutely hate Yelp. And I get it. Yelp plays middleman and they play God in the middle of these reviews and they decide what stays and what goes, which is a horrible business practice. I don't like Yelp either. But the public does. So if the public is using Yelp, we kind of have to pay attention to it. And if there is a bad review out there on Yelp, everybody's knee-jerk reaction is, well, it's not true, so screw them. Well, okay, it, it, it probably isn't true. I mean, rarely are they completely factually accurate if they're a negative review. So instead of saying, well, let's set the record straight and let's tell the public what really happened. And so the reputation management side of the business that I'm in, I take out the emotion. I take out the, the, what we really want to say to that guy. And we got to tone it down a little bit. We got to be, you know, uh, a little bit uh, politically correct. And we can say, actually, what, what, you know, what really happened was A, B, and C. And we, we can word it in a way that it's not offensive, but it sets the record straight. And I'm, I'm, yes, I'm, I'm responding to the, to the author of the review, kind of, but I'm really responding to the public, to the rest of that ocean that's reading that review. Yes, yes, very important. What do those guys want to see? And that's, that's the point of response, responding. Yeah, I mean, there's a real tact involved. There's a real, you know strategy in responding to these negative reviews because you don't want to engage the customer yet you definitely want to set the record straight like you said and that's a real balance to find and some people can feel confrontational because they hey that that was completely unjustified they shouldn't have said that that didn't ha-, you know and you don't want to mm-hmm. approach it that way there's a there's a real fine line between how you approach it. But like you said, it's reaching the ocean of people that are going to read that, that are going to make their own decision as to, should I check that place out and, you know, totally dismiss what the poster said versus what the respondee said. Right. And if there's, if there's one that says, well, I mean, the worst ones we get are like the food poisoning ones. Yeah. And like, I, I, I was, uh, I ate here and within what, by the time I finished my meal, I was already feeling sick. I went home. I was sick all night. And we all know that's not how food poisoning works. So we can respond with, look, depending on the strain of bacteria, some kick in within six hours, some kick in the next day. It takes a lot longer than that. The period is a lot longer than, oh, five minutes after I ate that meal, I felt sick. And then I spent, yeah, it's like there are those customers that try to get something for nothing with that approach, but they're not informed because you're right. It takes hours in most cases if it's true food poisoning. Sure. And so the public that's reading that doesn't know that. No. So if we're responding with, with actual scientific facts instead of opinions, we're never going to be in the wrong. I mean, as long as it's worded correctly, but yeah, that's a, that's a great way to put out that fire. So if I'm the, the public, like, Oh my God, I'm going to, I'm going to get sick if I'm going there. Oh wait. Okay. Now I get it. That wasn't really this place. It couldn't have, it couldn't have possibly been this place. So that's, that, that's, you know, great example. Let's go back to the SEO you're talking about. You know, search engine rankings are so important. And I may be misinformed about this because I'm no expert and you certainly are. But back in the day, it used to be fairly expensive to pay somebody to do your SEO, do it properly, and to get you where you wanted to go. Is the price come down because there's so many people doing it? I mean, what what determines the the pricing or the cost or a budget you should have to get the results you want using search engine optimization? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, here's 
why it's so effective is because I, I think I touched on this a second ago, but nobody does it, right? So no bars and restaurants really do it. I would say maybe 3% of them actually spend, have a budget for SEO, which is just completely insane to me. So when we're going from doing nothing to doing the bare minimum, we're ahead of everybody. So there's, there's, SEO is a very broad word and there's a whole bunch of different approaches it takes to, to get there. there. There's blogging, there's all sorts of, of, you know, using meta and alt tags internally to the website. There's my, my method is backlinking, which is kind of widely accepted as the most successful mm-hmm. approach, which I'm not going to get into it because in my book, I, kind of, I talk about it a lot more, but it gets super nerdy. But how to explain it and not lose people is that if, if, if my online presence is all over the internet and it's all consistent and it all looks exactly the same and it's all, uh, I'm on 70, 80, 100 different directories around the internet, Google looks at that and says, okay, this guy cares about his ranking. They care about where they want to be on, on, the, on the search results since they're thorough, just like a kindergarten teacher. You're thorough, A+. Plus. You do the bare minimum, C- minus with everybody else. So it's gone from, yes, you can hire somebody for $5,000 a month to do all this insane stuff for you. And all, every aspect of SEO will be covered and you'll be the, the best ranking guy in the world. But are you going to get your money back out of that? There's no way. You're not going to get an additional you know, $50,000 worth of business in the door from that. It's just not possible. So my, I mean, my services start around 250 bucks a month. That's how cheap it is to get in this, into this and dominate everybody within 90 days. That's, that's all it takes. So it's, it's really, really easy to do. And I've built a great business on it because once they see, okay, that sounds kind of, very good to be true. It sounds cheap. It sounds like if I can start ranking in 90 days and start being at the top and I can measure this and I can prove it, then okay. And there are, some of them are skeptical. Some of them are, are word of mouth. So they already get it. Some of them read my book and like, okay, that makes a hundred percent sense. And once they see the results, they're like, okay, now I'm a believer. Now I've gone from, and I usually, you know, I'll get one out of, you know, say it's a restaurant ownership group. They've got 10 restaurants. Let's try it with one is always the first thing. Great. Cool. Let's try it with one. Once they see the results, okay, here's the rest of them. And that's, that's how it goes kind of every single time. But it's, um, yeah, it, it used to be extraordinarily expensive. And it was so innocuous and so vague that no one can really put their finger on like, well, what are you doing? What are you actually doing behind the scenes to make this stuff happen? And I'd be glad to show my clients. But most of them like, look, I don't care what you're doing. As long as you show the result, as long as you can measure that result and I see people in the door, I don't care. But either way, I'd be glad to show people how it works. It's just, it's, it's, it's a very complicated, very boring, very not sexy, you know, industry. But, uh, but yeah, that's, a, that's an awesome question. But you just gave us a very compelling reason why every operator out there should take a real hard look at this and make it work for your place because you can't afford not to. And especially if you're in a tourist economy, because yeah. let's go back to the ocean yeah, and the fishbowl. Exactly right. Tourists are all in the ocean, every one of them. No one, no one in a tourist economy follows you on Facebook. These people don't know you exist. They don't know you're there. They would never follow a place who's, say, you know, a five-hour plane ride away from them. It doesn't make any sense to get see these ads where they're not even a potential customer. So in, in 100% tourist economies, places on the Strip in Vegas, yes. I don't even know why they would have social media. It just doesn't make any sense. Nobody's going to follow that guy, and certainly nobody's going to walk in the door because of what they post but they're certainly going to see them on Yelp and Google and TripAdvisor, no question. Well, you know, that's another interesting point, how technology has evolved this business because back before the internet and before social media and online reviews and all that kind of stuff, when you were in a tourist economy, you had an unending stream of new customers constantly coming to a place like Vegas or wherever. And you didn't have to focus on the service and giving great experiences because it was like, you know, shooting fish in a barrel. They're just walking in the door. If you had a great location or whatever, that sort of thing. And now suddenly you've got to focus on all those details and have that it that we talked about 
and then stand out amongst the sea of other competitors out there to get that ocean. So you got an ocean of competitors all trying to reach that ocean of consumers. So you really got to do everything you can to make, make that happen. Sure. Yeah, that's that. And it's like I said, it's more, more uh, important now than it's ever been. And it's in, in the twenties, yep. which is crazy that it's called the, now we're in the twenties. But in the in the twenties, it's going to be way worse and way more competitive, and and I think we'll see uh, we'll see a lot more places go out of business who can't hang with being aesthetically pleasing and with with going through those motions. So we've covered a lot of your philosophies, and we haven't even really gotten into the book yet. But the the title of your new book is Restaurant and Bar Marketing Two: Hacking Human Nature. Yep. I'm getting a sense that the human nature thing is putting yourself into the mind of the consumer and figuring out how they would go about finding a place that they wanted to go to. And 100%. Thus, right? And thus the Yelp and TripAdvisor and Google, because that's the first thing people are doing when they're on their phones, okay? Because human nature is doing what people would naturally think of first, okay? So that book, you also have a really great concept that that is like, uh, I think you're related to people taking tests. Why don't you bring us there? Because that was really interesting. Yeah. So the, the uh, restaurant owners are getting bombarded with so much crap from these people calling themselves marketing experts. And they, uh, the, the people that call themselves marketing experts these days is laughable. And they're the people who, they were an intern. They worked in a, a restaurant ownership group for a week. And they saw them going through the motions of social media. They create a, a party or an event. They create a flyer. They put it on social media and they're done. And they see this process. So like, oh, well, I'm a marketing expert. I could do that. But it's, it's getting to be, it's so dumbed down these days and it's so ineffective. And of course, none of it's provable. We don't know if it's working. And these people go out there and they hit up these, these restaurant owners with such a great sales pitch that it sounds impressive. But my analogy was, was picture a room full of people all taking a test that nobody studied for. So everybody is copying off everybody else's paper. So now we've got a whole bunch, we've got hundreds of, of versions of the wrong answer, right? So everybody is just thinking, well, let's look at what our competition is doing. Let's do that. And everybody has the same knee jerk reaction. What are they doing? They're successful. They're our competition. They're block away. What are they doing? Let's do that. And they keep doing that same thing and going down those making the same mistakes that that guy's making and their competition may be successful from some completely unrelated aspect. They may have a better location. They may have the it factor. They may have something that we don't know, but that's what everybody does. Even the, the big guys, like I talked to places in LA in Vegas, I'm like, what do you, where'd you get your approach? I'm like, well, honestly, uh, they were doing it across the street. So yeah. we figured we'd try it. And it's, it's insane how many people are, have uneducated approaches based on what their competition is doing. And don't think you're there. Believe me, your competition does not know what they're doing either. They're doing the same exact thing you are. And, that, and that's the, what's worse is these marketing experts that they call themselves are perpetuating this. And they're making it worse because they're taking the easy road and they're just duplicating what they saw somebody else do and making a, uh, like an air quote business out of it. And for some reason, restaurant owners are buying this. And here we are with the $1,000 social media post guy. We're back to that one. And that, that's what they, what they sell is what's easy, what they like to do. They, I, hell, I like to post on social media, but it doesn't make me business. It doesn't make my clients business. So I don't do it. I, you know, I stick with what measurably works. That is a really interesting point you're making. And I'm trying to phrase this question so that it comes across properly to the audience because what I used to do was monitor my competition closely, but, but we would zig when they would zag or we would zag when they would zig. I mean, we never did what they did, but we stood, we always stayed on top of what they were up to, but we played our best game. But what I'm hearing is the competition is kind of irrelevant because you don't want to copy what any of them are doing. It's like because most of them are doing it wrong and there's a new approach. And, and what we've talked about today is clearly, you know, zagging when everyone else is going in the other direction. So 
Should we, I mean, what should we do about the competition? I mean, you should know what they're doing, but don't pay too close of attention because, or don't copy anything you're doing. I mean, sometimes there are good ideas out there. Um, Right. And I would say, pay attention to why humans respond to what they're doing. Do they respond to it because it's, it's something that, that is unique and clever. Then if so, don't rip off what they're doing and think it's going to work. If, if it's something clever, if it's something that's like people will talk about, did you see what they're doing at that place? I can't believe that. Okay, that, then the cleverness is what you need to, to replicate, not their plan. But uh, what, what seems to be working now is this, is, this has always worked. This is common sense, but this is by far the most going to be the most effective thing going into the 20s. Is people are making these 30-second, 60-second clever videos based on like a uh, something relative relevant in the news, right? And there's the one that that, I, that sticks out in my head was done by a place called the Beverly here in Scottsdale years ago. This was this was four years ago. They did a video. Remember that that guy that got thrown off the airplane? It, it was it was the guy who was they were over capacity and they threw him out and they were filming it and the guy kind of freaked out and made this huge scene as they're dragging him off the plane. Yes, I, I, was everyone because, remembers like, that. Yeah, right. It was because like a, a, a like a, a an employee of the airline wanted to sit down, and they didn't have enough room for him. Turns out, and they threw this guy off, and it was that huge news media thing. So it was. Anyway, the Beverly's uh, timing was perfect. So right then, I think it had to be like the day after, they did a mock up video of their they're in their own restaurant, so it's tied to the restaurant. Yes, it's a marketing piece. It's kind of advertising, but not really. And they they had a they sh- they filmed the guy. Uh, they had a, a video crew which. The guy worked there, so it was free. He was sitting in a booth, and they said, hey, sir, excuse me, we'll, uh, our employees would like to sit down here, so we're going to need this booth. And the guy's like, uh, whatever. So they, one of their big security guys comes and grabs a guy and drags him out of the booth and drags him outside and throws him, throwing him into the, into the sidewalk. And then their employees go and sit down and, and start ordering like nothing ever happened. And it was produced in a way that it was hilarious. And it was, it was so relevant at the time that people – really resonated with it and like okay that is funny yep. so then it got you know hundreds of thousands of views everywhere on youtube on social on everywhere people were talking about it created a buzz now people that saw it that have no interest in even marketing the place were discussing it and then it was like wait where is this place the beverly okay check it out and they and i knew some people over there and they said it absolutely brought more people in the door no question i mean their numbers spiked in a direct relation to that video. So that video was completely free because they use people that, you know, they use the resources they had and there, you know, the filming was free. The entire thing was free. Creativity was free and they did the entire thing for, and they, that's the only thing they would have had to post on social for that entire week. And it was so effective. That's all it takes is yeah. one of those per month, per week, whatever, use your brain, use your creativity and that stuff kills as opposed to like, you know, some social media post of a picture of a burger every couple of days. I call that marketing firepower because it really is. That is awesome. And, and everyone got it, you know, because of the timing. Like you said, timing is, is critically important. And capturing, you know, or recapturing that lightning in a bottle from something that captured, you know, international attention and now suddenly calling attention to your place by, by using that. I mean, that's genius too, right? Yeah, that was just so well done. And it was... Cool. The, and they did a lot of those. I mean, this place is known for for their their videos that have to do with with stuff like that that's relevant. And they would yeah. the only mention of their place was a logo in the outro. That's it. Beautiful. Which is subtly brilliant. That is really awesome. Awesome. So the book is available um, on Amazon. Is it also available on your website? It no. There's a link from the website to Amazon, but I have an exclusive with Amazon, so gotcha. all my sales have to go through them. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it, uh, it, you could go to Amazon and just type in restaurant and bar marketing into the search bar or my name, Eric Schellenberger, and it'll be the first one that comes up. And uh, yeah, uh, you don't necessarily have to read the first one to get the second one, but the first one I do go into depth about the, the fishbowl in the ocean. So which is a, a really good concept to kind of get the, uh, the, the, the full meaning of it and how it applies to everything we do. And the, you know, the second one can be read independently if you just want to get that one. So either way it works. Restaurant and bar marketing one and two, both That's with, right. uh, catchy subtitles. That's right. 
Anything else we missed in this conversation? I mean, we went all over the map, but what a powerful marketing episode that sort of zigs when everyone else is zagging and, and is going in a different direction. I love your philosophies because you, you definitely stand apart. You speak from experience, and that's, I guess, why I called you a restaurant and bar marketing guru. I mean, you've got amazing ideas, creative, resourceful, and what an eye opener I think this episode is going to be for people that just don't know how to market their place or they copy the competition thinking that's the right way to do it. And it really isn't. Yeah. You got to find your own way in this world, you know? Right. And it's and like I said, think like a consumer. If you think like a consumer, does it make sense to you? If somebody's approaching you with a marketing plan, would you as a consumer respond to it? Does it make sense? And most of the time when people go through these elaborate, you know, whatever these crazy things people pitch them, like, well, no, I wouldn't see that. I wouldn't respond to that. But I guess the guy's telling me this is how it works when it's not. So put your consumer hat on and think like you're somebody getting, getting uh, um, marketed to as opposed to a sales pitch. And, <clears throat> and just keep that in mind that what you, everybody thinks like, well, that's me. Everybody probably thinks differently than me. They don't. Everybody thinks the same. Everybody responds to the same stuff more or less. And, uh, and we, all, we all respond to creative, visually stimulating things, great aesthetics, all the same. So that, that is universally effective. How can people follow you, Eric? So uh, my personal Facebook is uh, facebook.com forward slash Eric Schellenberger, spelled like... There you go. That? <laughs> Got it. And, I, I don't really use my Bar Marketing Basics Facebook page for the exactly the reason why I kind of preached to everybody else that sure. business pages have a giant disadvantage, so I really don't go yeah. down that road. But um, barmarketingbasics.com, and of course, the, the books on Amazon, any one of those search terms works, uh, restaurant and bar marketing, or type in my name. And uh, my YouTube page, which is linked from the Bar Marketing Basics page, but the actual YouTube link is way too long to put here, but uh, that's how you can find that. I have a lot of, I have a lot of video blogs and a lot of videos on, kind of little one and two minute videos of how to do something or kind of the the the, the concepts we were talking here, only broken down and really easy to to digest way. Well, this has been amazing catching up with you again. Like I said, the first episode we recorded was probably over a year ago, and you've yeah. come a long way since. Um, you're, again, sharing your expertise in, in marketing, and I love the fact that uh, controversial is not the right word. You definitely stand apart from the way people typically think, and I definitely believe that the audience is going to benefit tremendously. There are just so many different great ideas that we talked about in this episode. So I really appreciate your, your coming back again on the show. Yeah, I, I call it my very unpopular opinion. And uh, I think that, that I, not a lot of people think like that, but it's, it's usually the, uh, you know, the, the other marketing people are like, no, 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 no. He's not getting success because he's not doing it right. And he's got to do it this way and do it this way. And you know, we've all tried it and it hasn't worked. But uh, I just had a guy that, that got a hold of me a couple last week. That, who's a marketing guy? He's like, thank you. He's like somebody else who thinks like me. He's like, I've thought exactly like that this entire time, but I was afraid to say anything because nobody, everybody else says exactly the opposite. He says, you backed up everything I thought was true about marketing this entire time. And he owns a marketing company. So I'm glad I have at least another ally out there. But anyway, no, I appreciate you having me on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that's it, audience. Easily executable, actionable, powerful ideas to rock your restaurant. This is the Restaurant Rockstars podcast, and we will see you in the next episode. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks again. Andy. Thank you. Guys, what a thought-provoking episode that was. And once again, thanks to Mr. Eric Schellenberger. And why not check out his book, Restaurant and Bar Marketing 2, Hacking Human Nature. I think it's a really cool way of taking a new approach to your marketing. Listen, I really love uh, this business. I've got a passion for it, and I also love talking shop with other operators. If you've got some challenges or pain points that are keeping you up at night, why not uh, reach out to me? I love, like I said, setting up these half-hour complimentary calls just with my listeners, my audience, and we'll talk about, again, your challenges and pain points and how I might be able to help. Again, no obligation, just talking shop. So reach out to me, Roger, R-O-G-E-R, -E at restaurantrockstars.com. 
com. I really appreciate you listening, and if you like what you're hearing, please leave us a review on iTunes. Of course, it will help other owners, managers, hospitality industry professionals find us, and we will see you in the next episode. Thanks for listening to the Restaurant Rockstars Podcast. For lots of great resources, head over to restaurantrockstars.com. See you next time.